This is one of my favorite weeks in the year in the United States, and because it is the Thanksgiving week, right? And um, I don't know how many of you feel like your family actually is like that. Everybody behaves. Everybody is sitting nicely. You know how well dressed up is every. The table is perfect. But maybe this is in your family. But if you look in the Stewart family, maybe it's more something like that. You know, is anyone who feels more identified with that than the other? Amen. You know, it's kind of crazy. We love family. We love family. But we always have that moment of awkwardness. I mean, there is a reason why you don't live with them, right? You're like, I'm far away from you except on Thanksgiving. And um, there is always these dynamics that get sometimes very unique. Some of them are kind of funny. Some of them are kind of tension. In our family, mainly is the whole bicultural issue. And uh, one time I remember that grandma, Abel's grandma who passed uh, two years ago, um, she was already in her 90s and she called Abel and said, you know, I don't have energy to do an entire um, dinner for Thanksgiving, but I can do the, the turkey, so everything else, I cannot do that. And Abel says, don't worry, Granny, Lupina will do everything else. And I'm thank you, thank you for volunteering me, right? Besides, I cook Mexican food. I, I don't cook. I don't know how to do that. I mean, grandma was a really good cook. How can I gonna do that? So what I did is I called everybody in the office. I thought they were thinking I'm going to have a very serious meeting that day. And I'm like, how do you cook stuffing? I mean, how do you do the cranberry thing? I mean, I remember asking everybody to figure that out. And I go home and I'm taking all these things in grandma's house. And in the moment I'm taking the... How is that cranberry, cranberry sauce, right? I bought a can. I'm like, I'm not going to get it. Well, but I'm taking it out, Rebecca. And grandma comes from the back and says, oh, by the way, I also did a cranberry sauce because I hate those canned cranberries. And I look at my can and I throw it. I'm like, I didn't bring it, you know. So but <laughs> it's even funny, but there, there are dynamics in every family. There is a dynamic in every family. But I'm going to give you the key word to survive the dynamics in your family, the key word. Are you ready? How do you survive interacting with your family and your household? This is the word, disciple. You are going there as a disciple of Christ. You're going to go there with the character of a disciple to interact with your family. Now, all of us as disciples of Christ, we know what it means. Now, if you don't remember, let me remind you here. A disciple, I love this definition, is a trust-based, obedient lifestyle. It comes because you know who you are trusting. Who are we trusting? God. We gave him our lives to the Lord. Now, if you have never done that here, I encourage you. And actually, you know, I'm going to be praying for you. And I know people here will be praying for you that your best Thanksgiving present that you have this week is that you know who is this God because he's worth to be trusted. Is a God that you were able to give your life to him. You have seen him taking you in pieces and he puts you back together in a way that you couldn't even imagine. One of the things I have been learning with the Lord is that God is capable, capable to take what is your brokenness and from that brokenness, he brings healing and he brings even a ministry for others. So when we are disciples, it's about accepting what God is giving you, accepting that restoration from the Lord. And as a side effect, as a consequence of that, then you obey. Your life changes because now you're obeying the Lord. But because of that, you become a follower of Christ. And through that, you're also showing to others who is the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's very important that as a follower of Christ, you also think in this. A discipler, that's a word that I did not do, but I like it. It says, a disciple first role models a way of life before he or she instructs others. So it's not about me telling you how to be a Christian. It's about me showing you how is to be a Christian. I remember a pastor in Mexico who said, you know, after all these years in ministry, I learned one thing. People don't remember my sermons, but people will remember what I did. And I thought, and all the time I'm wasting. 
in writing this sermon, right? <laughs> but it is true. It's a lot about what you do that speaks very loud about what is a disciple. And then the words that you say that are also important are actually just going to emphasize your actions. So even Jesus taught us that. The scripture says in John 14, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. It is that we see the Lord Jesus Christ, we know how is our God. And by that, we accept that relationship with Christ, and then you and I become a way where others can see how is Christ, because we model that through his grace. We are also learning from another great person in the Bible. This is our very last day with him, with our father Abraham. And Abraham was actually a disciple too. And we learn how his behavior in many ways is teaching us about who the Lord is. And he also was teaching us how does a person who has a connection with God looks like. Now, was he perfect? No. He had a lot of mistakes. But the difference of the Christian is that the Christian repents. We repent. Now, I know maybe in your family it does not happen. But at least it happened in the Mexican families. When you become the Christian of the family, and then you go and visit, then your family is policing you, your behavior. Well, maybe it's, it's a Mexican thing, right? It's a, it's a, is it? Does it happen to you? No, like, as soon as you do something wrong, aren't you a Christian? Right? Now, again, it doesn't happen to you. It happened in Mexico, in Cuba. Maybe in Cuba, right? Clara. And say, ¿qué pasó, chico? No, I'm not. So they immediately like, like tell you that. So what I recommend you to remind people is, as a Christian, I'm a broken vessel that is in process of redemption. So don't feel yourself that you are not allowed to do mistakes. We are going to do mistakes, but we go to the right source for healing. And that's all what we are. As disciples, we know where to go for that healing. And through Abraham, we also learn other things about what is a disciple. A disciple is also that one capable to have radical hospitality. And we learn that when we're open in that hospitality, we open space for grace, for a new place in our lives, for a relationship with God, and to listen to God's word. We also learned in weeks ago about how it is that as a disciple of God, we are capable to love everyone. And because we love everyone, we intercede for everyone. Does it mean that I agree with everyone? No. But can I intercede for everyone? Absolutely. It's part of our Christian growth. And we learned last week that as Christians, we are also challenged to grow. And that one of the challenges that we have is to learn not to let the fear detour take over. But we learn to say and to proclaim and to live what the Lord says in the Bible over and over, and that is, do not fear. So we live that life. So now we're going to learn also what it means to disciple, but to disciple in your household. And a lot of these, I actually appreciate the ministry that is called Restoration Ministries, because a lot of this material came from them. And what we see in here is this. We find Abraham in this beautiful scripture is one verse, but it's a very dense verse. And it says, for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised them. He promised him. So there is a promise that God is willing to give to Abraham, but there are three key things that happen to take that promise. First of all is this. It says, for I have what? Chosen him. Chosen him. So what happened is, in this case, what Abraham is doing is Abraham is becoming ecclesia. You remember that word? What does ecclesia mean? Church. Actually, in Spanish, it's very similar. Iglesia. Ecclesia. So he became church. Why does he become church? Because church means those who are called out. Meaning you are chosen, you are consecrated in a way that your life now is going to be doing God's will. Now, in the case of Abraham, it's a very literal. Because if you remember what was God's call for him, get out of your house and you're going to go to a land that I'm going to give to you and to your next generations. So it was a very literal moment to say, take all your stuff, and then you're going to go. 
That is the same call that you and I have. And actually, I have told you this before, about when we talk about this great commission that God tells us, he says, go and make disciples of all nations. But we remember that the main emphasis in that sentence is not the go, is what? Make disciples, because the go is natural. We go because we are not trees. We walk around, and therefore, we go. The difference that God calls us to do is that you consecrate all your goals. What it means is that when you and I wake up in the morning, and as soon as we step in the floor, what we say is like, Lord, whatever my goals are today, may you be the one leading. So God, when I'm interacting with my family, and I need to tell my children to get ready, and they are looking forward to wake up early in the morning and go to school, you go in the name of Jesus. <laughs> when you go to work and you're going to confront a difficult situation, you say, God, I, I bring this goal before your presence, asking that your wisdom will be with me in the decisions that I take. Maybe you are going to a place that you are going to enjoy and say, God, I bring this goal to you as a place where I can be thankful for the celebration that I have here. There will be times when you're going to say, God, I'm going to a goal that I don't want to go, but I need to go. You know which ones I'm talking about? But even I don't want to go, then I say, God, in your name I'm going. Therefore, it's consecrated for your glory. Because when we do that, do you realize what happened with the place where you go? That place becomes sacred. You are opening a space in that place to become sacred. And I have learned something else. Somehow, we have allowed the culture to tell us that people are not open to the gospel. But you know, that's a lie. That is a lie. Because what happened is actually the opposite. I'm sensing that right now, people are thirsty to find meaning in life and they are open to listen to the gospel in the places that you cannot even imagine. And But in those places, if you go there thinking, Lord, allow my goals to really be used by you, you will see how God opens doors in ways you could not even dream about it. Brian was humble. He didn't explain why he's visiting people in his job. The reason is because he had a change of position. And he's now like a big name. Uh, Tom, explain me what is it. He's a big name. He has like 1,200 people working under him or so. And I went to see him. And while I'm looking at him, I was so, so proud of him and Carla. And I'm looking at him. And the very first thing that he says when he receives this place, he says, I am blessed. When he said that, it's like, God, you took over. You allow Brian to become an instrument for you to go and to proclaim that space as your space. A few days ago, I was shopping in Ross, and I went with Abel. And after one minute, Abel says, this is not my thing. I'm going for a coffee. So he left me. So here I am shopping after, and I'm shopping. And after that, I go and I, I'm paying and I see that there is not a lot of people at that time and there are the ladies, the, the cashiers, and I start talking to them and I said, you know, I know this is becoming now the heavy season uh, time for you guys, right? And they said, oh, yes. And I told them, I'm sure it's a little bit stressful. And they told me, yeah, and some of our clients are actually very rude. And they, they just, one of them, she says, they just start shouting to me because I wasn't fast enough. And it's true because I was coming into the store and there was a lady shouting like crazy at the entrance. And I'm like, Lord, don't let her come in. <laughs> but, you know, but it was just weird. So while she's telling me all that story, I just, I just felt God telling me, pray for them, pray for them. But like, you know how when God is no option. If you don't pray for them, you will die. You're almost like, that. like okay, God, I'm praying for them. So I'm like, you know, I told them, it, I'm blessing you in the name of Jesus. I bless your lives. I bless that while you're working in this place, may God bring peace to you guys. And I'm saying that aloud in the store. And uh, one of them starts speaking Spanish to me. And I'm thinking, how do you know I speak Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm like, and I'm like uh, so I'm standing there and I'm 
play. I'll play in that goal. You will be here. That you take this place. That the peace is in your place. And that it, this is a place of shalom. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And the ladies look at me and they say, thank you. And I'm thinking, what did I just do? Oh my gosh. This is a store. And we're just proclaiming Jesus in here. Okay, and I'm so excited, and I go to the car, and I tell Abel, I pray in Ross, aloud. And then he says, what are you going to say? Now let's go to Coles? No way. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, well, I was going to suggest that. One store at a time, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and like, but we're not going to a guitar store, you know. So, but anyway, but what I learned is like, why in the world were they so open? I mean, I, is, you hear what I'm saying? They were like asking almost for the prayer. I have gone to schools and they say, can you pray for them? I mean, we are just looking at a culture and a society where we have Christians, the misunderstanding that they are not going to be open to the prayer. But they are. They are. So what happens, the difference is that from now on, guys, when we go, we go and say, God, allow me to embrace who I am as your child. Allow me to embrace the power that I have as a Christian and stand up in this household that you gave me and proclaim your love to this place. And guys, just enjoy the fact of seeing a community be transformed in the name of Jesus. God has great plans for this household. We just need to allow our goals to be empowered. And we have specific things in those goals. And the scripture says, so that he will direct his children and his household after him. So this is Abraham understanding. He's setting an example. What is the example? It's a very simple example. What we see in the scripture is telling us is that Abraham needs just to have the ministry of pointing. It's an easy one. Have you ever seen a two-year-old with a grandparent? They don't talk to each other, but if the child says, what happens? The grandpa goes. If it's the mom or the no, are you crazy? But if it's the grandpa, then the grandpa goes. You know, they point and that's where they go. That is the ministry that we have. You know, it's the ministry of understanding that we are not the people who are making amazing things. We're pointing to Jesus. So whenever we have a person who says, you know, I'm struggling. Let me point you where. You know I need prayers. Let me point you where. You know something Satan is trying to lie. Let me point him where he needs to live right now. So it's the ministry of pointing. That is what it is about. Now we're pointing, but we also receive from God something that are called landmarks. Especially if this was very clear for Abraham because where they needed to walk in all these areas, there was no map, there was no road, there were landmarks that showed them where to go. So the landmark that we have to know where God is calling us to go is the scripture. The Bible says, your word is a lamp to my feet and what? A light to where? To my path. So if we want to know what it means to be a Christian. How do I behave as a Christian? What kind of resources do I have as a Christian? Point people to the scripture. The Bible is not God. The Bible talks to us about the word of God so we can experience that. And then what we find in here, and I love this from Abraham. Abraham is not thinking just about children. Yes, he cares about his family. And yes, he's bringing this example of disciple to his family. But he's thinking more of kind of a Hispanic family. You know, like everybody, everyone needs to be in there. Maybe one of them is not even a relative, but they consider them a relative. This is the household. This is for us that Ross store. This is the job of Brian. This is where you work. That is your household. So we are called to be disciples in that household. So you go on Thanksgiving and you go proclaiming in your family and you say, I'm going as a disciple and you give thanks to God for that. And when you leave, you give thanks to God that you survive. But you are going to bring that opportunity to share the love of Christ to others by your example. And then we learn too, what exactly we do. 
to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, to keep the way of the Lord. That's an important concept for the Hebrews, to keep the way of the Lord. What does keep means for them? Keep means to be the watchman, to be able to say, I recognize that is the right way. That is the right way to go. This is the right place to go. How do we recognize this? This is what the scripture is so intentional in telling us in Proverbs. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. What it means is that when somebody has been able to taste the flavor of being in that uh, way of the Lord, you can discern when it's not. I don't know how many of you have been in a diet. Amen. <laughs> and it happens that when you are probably in the first week, you're feeling like miserable. But then the second, the third week, you're starting to get used to. When you go to that fourth week, if you get it <laughs> in there, and you try to eat something that is not healthy, what happens? You feel like, well, you know, it's nasty. You feel it heavy. You recognize the difference. That's exactly what the Lord is telling us. You need to train the children in the ways of the Lord. Why? Because since he, if they know that when they are little, they will recognize. They will be able to find that flavor of saying, you know, what you are suggesting me to do is not something that makes me feel comfortable or whole. I'm not doing it. You know, those kind of words or that kind of statement or what you're trying to proclaim on my presence or in my person, that is not something that God says who I am, so I'm not going to accept that. So you prepare them because they have that training. And the training also comes with two very important words. One of them is righteousness and the other one is justice. And sometimes it can get confused because they come together. The way I see it is like this. Righteousness is fulfilling the obligations of a relationship. In other words, you are living in a covenant. It is the fact that your life has a specific behavior toward the world because you are a child of God. There are certain things that you just by the nature of being a child of God, you say, I am going to do this or I'm not going to do this. I protect myself from these things. I hear the Holy Spirit. I pray. So all of that, all that righteousness is the way you are interacting and you see in the world. But a fruit of the righteousness is justice. Justice is because you are perceiving and looking at the world through those Christian eyes, then you are able to see a person that is dealing with something that is unjust or unfair, especially the poor and the person in need. So as a Christian, you are called to react to that. You are called to say, I can't just be sitting in here. Like what we were sharing on the announcements, I know that the homeless community receive a lot of support during the beginning of Christmas season. As soon as Christmas is over, their support goes down. We can see that. We cannot just sit and look at that happening. We need to respond. So the way we respond is we're doing these bags. But at the same time, we're trying to see ways where we transform that entire neighborhood so that people in the future can see that that place has been changed because of the presence of God through the church. So that's where we're investing on that because we can see that righteousness and justice coming together. So all of this is because there is a specific purpose. And it is that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised to him. And you and I are part of that promise. The scripture says, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and hers according to the promise. You and I are part of that promise. You and I are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is...